Okay. Okay. So thank you, Martha. And thank you all for introducing yourselves. And I, I know it's really in a precept class. It's not like a lot of other studies where you get a lot of social time with one another. It really is. We're doing homework, right? And we're discussing what you worked on. So um, I'm thankful for that introductory time though, because I, we don't get to do that often. And this group is smaller. This uh, than some of my other classes have been. So, although we're we're full size, how many do we have here today? Do we? We have eighteen in the room and me nineteen. So, and then our our Zoom one. So we're over twenty now in our morning group, and we'll have probably about half that in the evening. But I mean, remember the days when we had a hundred? <laughs> yeah. I know, no, everybody's going, really? And we're, yes, <laughs> we had we had 60 at one time in our, six about 60 in the morning group and 40 in the evening, is that correct? Somewhere in there, right. So we, we have gotten smaller, but I love this actually. I like the fact that we're a little bit smaller because I can chat with you a little bit more. But on the other hand, I want it to grow because I want people educated in how to handle the word of God. So with that said, let's get into it, okay? you. Yeah, sadly, because what you don't understand, and, and I'm going to tell you this up front, it does not matter how many times you have done this study. You, Kathleen, you, is your, your one that's been here over and over, and um, who else said that they had done it over and over several times? Martha? No. Have you done Revelation several times? No. Okay, so just me and Kathleen, we're the experts in the room, Kathleen. <laughs> I'm calling on you for all the hard stuff. So keep, keep that in mind and get your homework done. <laughs> here's, here's the thing, you know, if you've got 10 years between doing them, which is about what we, I've been doing about every 10 years, I teach it again. Um, you kind of do forget, it gets fuzzy. So it's going back over it is, is good. The other thing is, is doing it again, the repetition of it actually is helpful because having some things put to bed those of you who just did Daniel with me, you'll know this. Now that you've been through Daniel once, even if you wait 10 years and we do it again, um, it's like there's the core things you never forget. Because of the method that we use, it, it deeply embeds to you those real basic truths. So that then the next time you go through it, you go, you're, you're relaxed in it. You're like, okay, I don't, I don't have to worry about that. What's going to happen for you with Revelation is every single thing that comes up, you're going to feel a little bit of anxiety about because you're going to be going, well, I want to know what that means. Well, it may take you six months before we get to the place where you'll understand that one little thing. Try not to stress too much. To try to enjoy the journey and understand that the method is precept upon precept upon precept upon precept. You have to learn some of these foundational things that we're gonna to do today, because that helps you understand the environment in which everything is written and why it's written, who it's written to. And then you build on that to begin to start looking at the pieces. And as you move through it, you, it, it, it takes a while, but once you get to a certain place, all that foundation building you spent the last four months working on now starts to come to fruition. The advantage of the student who did uh, Daniel with us is that Daniel is very similar to Revelation in the way that you handle it, and a lot of the information translates over. So what you learned in Daniel is going to be very beneficial to what you're going to be doing in the book of Revelation, okay? So don't stress, just enjoy the journey. And for those of you who are new, this is exciting. Think of the fact that God is starting you with this. And I want to encourage you. Paul, the very, one of the very first things Paul taught to the Thessalonian church after it was birthed was about his second coming, about the second coming of Jesus Christ, not Paul's coming, right? although he's coming too with him, <laughs> but about Jesus' second coming. And he said to them, don't be disturbed and don't be uh, afraid because don't think that the day of the Lord has come because it's not gonna come until, and remember he laid out those things. We just did this a couple weeks ago. 
And so he said, because these things haven't happened yet, you can be assured he's not here yet. So church, relax. But when these things start to happen, then you can know he's, going, he's right there at the door, right? So you and I are going to learn all these things. We're going to take a one bite at a time, eating that elephant, be very methodic about it, but enjoy the journey and get excited about every little piece that you learn. Okay. All right. So let's start with understanding that what we are doing right now is like a mini overview. Uh, precept ministries, we can thank them greatly for the curriculum that they gave to us because as difficult as it might even feel, feel or challenging as it might feel to us right now, this is a simplified form because what they did is they did all the, um, all the preliminary work and then what they did is they honed in and said, what do the students actually have to have in order to get through part one? Is that me or someone else? Not me. Okay. Um, Precept has taken the, 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 um, the context setting on this. And because Revelation is 22 chapters, can you imagine having to go through all 22 chapters, which is filled with so much that you would get lost in, and trying to figure out what is the major theme and what is the, the context of this and it would be confusing for you. You don't know where to start, where to stop, if you're new in this in particular. So what she has done is she has said, we're focusing on primarily chapter one and chapter 22, but then she extended it also into those first few uh, chapters, one uh, all the way through chapter five, so that you can kind of see the contextual setting. What we are aiming for at the end of this class is to see who is our author, who is our recipient, what is the author's purpose, what might be some of the areas where we might pull out a, a key verse to help us understand the book on the whole, right, and to uh, see the flow of this book, where are the segment divisions, and because she narrowed it down by just giving us basically chapters one through five plus 22, <laughs> It almost it, in a way it's like okay just give it away won't you okay because for those of us who've done it for any length of time if you know you can get your your major segment divisions out of just those six chapters you already know where your divisions pretty much have to fall but that's what we're doing today you're going to see your segment divisions you're going to see your major themes and it's going to begin to just kind of wet your whistle for what you're going to be doing next week when you start doing the uh the inductive work now how to study Bible. You are looking at chapters one and two if you're talking about doing an overview. What they want you, what she wants you to do in, uh, in a nutshell is to understand the context of this book. Chapter uh, one and it talks about context uh, rules for interpretation. And then chapter two, getting the big picture is called the overview. We are not doing an overview like you would normally do if you were doing a letter. A letter is usually four or five chapters at the most if you're in something a little bigger like Hebrews, but still it's, it's doable. But with 22 chapters plus most of it being prophetic imagery, it's, it's a huge task that would probably defeat most people, right? So what Precept did is they broke it down for you. That's why your overview is, is consolidated to just those few chapters. They're trying to help you. They know where you need to go to get the context information that you need to set your context. So they just eliminated all the other stuff in between so that you're not distracted. Wasn't that nice of them? Yes. <laughs> hoo hoo. Okay. So, uh, but if you want to know what, what it is that you did this week, chapter one and chapter two, that's context. Next week, so that you're prepared for this, we're going to be looking at chapter three. It's called focusing in on the details. And in this, in this part of the book, it gives you the instructions on the things that basically you need to do. Now, in the homework instructions, she has it broken down, as you know, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. And in theory, you're supposed to sit down each day and do one hour of homework, and you should be able to complete it in those five hours. Ha. Huh? <laughs> okay, I was waiting for responses. 
the, in reality, especially if you're new at this, it's going to probably take a little longer than that because you kind of, what happens is you, some, sometimes you go off on rabbit trails, sometimes you get confused about what it is that you're looking for and you, you spend time doing stuff you really didn't need to do or whatever. It doesn't hurt if you do too much. It only hurts if you don't do enough, okay? So sometimes I have found that students say, well, I did a word study on this, but then when I got done, it didn't, it didn't tell me anything. I'm going, but you know what you learned? You learned that that word that you thought was important wasn't. So you did learn something, right? You eliminated a subject matter that really doesn't play into the picture of what you're looking at. So no matter what you do inductively, whatever step you take, if you accomplish it and you get there and you think, well, I didn't learn anything or, or it meant exactly what it said, well, then that's what you learned. But don't ever think that it's a waste of your time, okay? But this overview that you're doing right now is, is tweaked to fit this particular book, okay? It's not the normal overview. A normal overview would be the whole book and you would look for these major words. When we get to one of those books, we'll do that together and I'll show it to you, okay? So don't freak out when you go in and read chapter one and two and you're going, well, we're not doing that. I know <laughs> because they tweaked it for this particular book because this is a very challenging book and they want to simplify it so you're not overwhelmed. They're making this, they're dumbing it down if you wanna say it that way for the layman, that would be this dummy, right? And they're bringing it down to a place where I can grapple with it for myself, okay? All right, and then next week, focusing in on the details. So make yourself a note to read chapter three through. It's, it's okay, it's this much paper teeny weeny sec it's not hardly any reading at all but that's what you need to read before you do your homework for next week so that you're prepared also in there she's going to tell you to go into chapter eight as well so make yourself a note chapter eight for next week read it it's talking about figures of speech meaning literary forms similes metaphors that kind of thing okay it's going to be it's it's very short it's like three pages and they're as you know, they're printed out and spaced out. It's almost nothing. It's like reading a couple of passages. Um, but she's going to be uh, explaining to you the kind of literary forms that you're going to encounter when you're in the book of Revelation and how to spot them so you can note them when you see them. Why would understanding the literary form be important for us? Why would that be an important thing to know? Yes, how to interpret it. Listen to the expert. How You cannot know how to handle a passage if you don't know what form of literary uh, work it is. If you're reading in the book of, of Matthew and it's a historical book, right? It's a historical reading, but all of a sudden you hit parables. Do you handle a parable in the same way you do the previous part of the text where it says he went here, he was with these people, he was at that site and this is what he did. And then you hit a parable. There was a man, he had a young boy and they, they went fishing and they, you know, I'm making this one up, it's not in there. But, <laughs> but do you see what I mean? It's it, anytime you change literary forms, you gotta go, okay, so why is he using this literary form and what does he want me to draw out of it? Obviously it's not the historical factual listing of things. There's a point or there's a message, right? So when you understand that that's the literary form that he's just translated into or moved into and you catch it and you identify it, then you can properly interpret what you're reading, right? That's why Kay is having you go in and read this chapter eight next week so that you understand prophecy in the book of Revelation you also have other literary forms that are going to be used, styles, and you just need to be aware of them so that when you spot them, you take note of that and uh, pay attention. And in here, it'll tell you how you're supposed to handle it. This is how you handle that kind of literary form. Okay. All right. 101 precept all done for the day. Now we can get into our homework. Yay. Everyone did homework, correct? We're good to go. Okay. Um, the, the uh, day one, she wanted you to see uh, who wrote the book, where it took place, 
and uh, looking for any kind of clues. Now, if she says things like this, basically she's saying, make a list. She doesn't state it in that way. In your how to study book, that's where you get the information where she says, mark a key word or mark a subject matter, in this case, who, what, why, when, where, how kinds of questions, and make lists on them. She rarely says make a list. I think she just doesn't want to scare you because of the work. But it does mean make a list. OK, so we're going to start with our author in what we looked at in this book about the author. And if you did not make a list, today is your lesson on why you need to be doing list making. OK, who is our author? We're going to get the big picture on this book. Who is the author of this book? Who's the, the human writer? John. So we have um, John. And I picked verse 4 as the more definitive one, although you see it also in verse 1, right? Right away. What do you learn about John in chapter 1 of, of uh, Revelation? Yes. He's a bond servant. Now, what is your first question about that? What does that mean? What is a bond servant? What is the implication there? What is, what is the meaning behind that? Now, we're not ready to dig into that part because we're not in chapter one's inductive work on focusing in on the details. Right now, we're trying to set context. So for right now, we're going to try to be happy with just understanding he's a bond servant. Who's he a bond servant to? I, that's right. So he's a bond servant of Jesus. Okay, we see that also in one one and also one four other places. Correct. What else did you learn about him? Yeah. So he was bearing witness to these things, right? He was one who. What does it mean to bear witness? I love the fact that what this is telling you is that he's an eyewitness to some things. He, he himself, how valuable is that? How important is that? Yeah, right. Even to all that he saw. Now, if you are an eyewitness and you go into a court of law, how valuable does that make you to the person who is either defending or, or prosecuting? right? And I can tell you for a fact, I, was, I did this one time, they had me come in and give a testament in a court case that, that I was, anyway, and they wanted to know, was I an eyewitness? As soon as I said, no, I heard it, you, you know what they did? She's dismissed. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm dismissed because I was not an eyewitness. So being an eyewitness is very profound, very significant. You can almost read right past it if you aren't careful. But if you slow down to stop and think about what does this mean? And why is this one of the first things that John tells us about himself in this? It, 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 I'm sorry, say it again. Yeah, it, it makes his statements or the things that he's written to be trustworthy because he himself was the witness. And what else does it do concerning him? It, would you say it gives him uh, validity or authority or credentialing, so to speak? Yeah. So the fact that he bore witness um, and, he, and in this case, he was bearing witness to the word of God, right? And uh, to the testimony of Jesus. All right, so that's in ver verse two. All right, what else do we learn about him? He's on the island of Patmos. So there's a where thing. He's on the island of Patmos. Okay. And what is the verse on that one? Okay. Thank you. One nine. Yes. Because of the word of God. 
Uh, so what does that tell you? What, what insight does that give you historically about what's going on? Apparently there's some kind of persecution that's going on and it's specific against who? Not just John, but who? Christians. Anyone who stands for the word of God, right? Who stands up about the testimony concerning Jesus Christ. Apparently uh, there's a, there is a consequence to that. In this case, it says he has been exiled to the island of Patmos. He's on the island of Patmos. Now, because of the word of God. So whatever it is that he did concerning the word of God, it landed him in a place because of that, right? Now, we don't know much at this point because we haven't done the research on it, but this coming week, you can do some research on the, the, the subject matter of the island of Patmos, what it was used for in that particular day in history. So when you Google it, you need to Google it in that manner that it's, you know, in the days of John, island of Patmos and see what comes up and start filtering through. It can take some time, so don't get too far down the rabbit trail on it, but it's interesting just to read some of that. Uh-huh. There you go. Yes. Yes, I, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Christ Jesus, was on the island called Patnos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And so in this case, one of the other things we learn is that he is, he is a brother. Now, what does that mean? He's a brother, spiritual brother, a Christian, if you want to put it in that way, you know, you want to put that in parentheses on your own. One of the things about list making that is important for me to teach is that when you make your list, be as careful as you can to go word for word from the text to your page. Now, obviously, sometimes in this classroom environment, I just write what you guys say sometimes and I don't check it. I'm trusting that you're trying to be as accurate as you can for me and always give me your, um, your reference, chapter one, verse nine, chapter one, verse four, whatever. That helps me to be able to put it up here. What this does for the classroom environment and gives us continuity. If you make a statement about something um, and, and uh, somebody wants to later look it up to see, well, what were they saying? Or I missed that and I didn't see that. They will have the scripture verse then to be able to know exactly where to go back and look. What that does is it again, it validates that what you've said is true right? Because you're taking it straight from the word. Okay. So he's a brother and that's in one nine also. Any other things that we see about him? He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So what does that tell you he was doing? Praying. So he was praying on the Lord's day, meaning the day of worship, right? Okay. And by the way, um, I wonder if I should give this away or not right now. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Everybody likes. You might want to just take a yellow highlighter or orange or whatever color you like and just highlight, highlight that phrase in the spirit because that is going to be a key repeated phrase. It's going to come up again later. It doesn't happen that many times in the book on the whole. So you may not catch that it's a key repeated phrase unless I tell you. <laughs> and maybe it's a little early that, and we will get into understanding that a lot better, but it's gonna be way down the road. So you might wanna just mark it though, okay? Uh, for right now, you don't need to know why it says it. You just need to know, mark it. <laughs> okay, what else? Okay, he hears a voice and this voice like the sound of a trumpet. Okay. Okay, so one of the things we learn is that he was instructed to write or to do or write. So let's put on here, he is, he is told to write. 
right? And then later he's told to send, okay, what he has written. Okay, so that's in uh, 11 and also 19, right? Yeah. Right, okay. See, already I'm beginning to remember verses because in my homework time, I spent so much time marking these things and going back and forth and back and forth and repeating them in my, in my list making. What was very interesting was how some, some lists ended up merging with others and becoming one. I didn't know it until I started doing it and then I merged them. Um, just so you, those of you who don't know me very well, one of the things I do is I start from scratch every time I do a study, just like you guys. I have a blank sheet and I start with my paper. I don't ever go back and just use my old stuff. Now I, as a teacher, go back sometimes and pull things later, but when I'm doing my homework, I'm starting from scratch, just like you are. So I, sometimes I probably relearn things I already learned once, but you know, that's okay, learn it again. Okay, so that tells us a little bit about John, who he is, why he's where he's at. He's there because of persecution for the, for the uh, Christian message about Christ and God. Um, he, is, he is a Christian brother. He's being persecuted. He is told to write and to send the things that he's being shown, right? And so what we see is um, that he was shown what? Or he saw, right? What will, what will soon take place? There, well, we could do that too, yeah. Uh, he was shown and saw. Um, I want to go back to one. That's really what I want to do. Let's do that. And that is exactly where Martha was taking us. Right. He, yes. Let's look at this, this progression of how we received, how John received this particular message. Because in verse one, one of the things she asked you to do in your homework was to see the progression of how this came to John. Who did what and how? So how did this all initiate this, this message from God? So we see, the, we see God, and what did God do? He gave it to Jesus, and Jesus gave it to an angel who gave it to John, and he gave it to us, the bond servants, right? I know, we can sing a song. Do you know, I do have a song about this particular book. When my kids were little, we were living in Turkey, and so we wanted them to learn this, about the seven churches, and we were traveling with them, of course. So we put all the, the seven churches to a tune. Let's, uh, let's see. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Philadelphia, Sardis, and Laodicea, seven churches. <laughs> pretty good huh except I sing terribly but other than that and so we did and we I'm telling you my husband was like please not again <laughs> because I sang it with my kids over and over every morning we'd get up and we'd sing the songs and we'd say what church are we at today and you know so they were learning these things and yeah everything to a tune so somebody can put this to a tune let's do that that's a great idea God gave it to Jesus who gave it to the uh, Farah Jaka might work that would work. I always try to come up with the tune first and then make it work. <laughs> okay, so we have the author's, what we have in the author's purpose for writing this is a, uh, basically a chain of command, right? That this message was first initiated by who? God, which is very interesting because in you and I's little compartmental brains, we have got, you know, we've got God here, Jesus here, the Holy Spirit here, right? And, and, but we also have this concept, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit is one. And so we're like, well, what do you mean God gave it to Jesus? Isn't Jesus God? And the answer is yes. <laughs> but what we also see though, what do you think God's showing us here even just in this little bit part that where God gave it to Jesus? There is, there's like, there is a designed program. See, this is the cool thing about God. He's all about design and order. And there is a design and order that has been put in place to demonstrate to you and I design and order. 
and it's one of the great things, it's one of the reasons parenting and homes work when they work is there's design and order. There's the husband, the wife, the children, right? The order is go make your bed, I'll cook the meals, daddy's going to work. I mean, whatever the order is, God has, there's design and order so that people have functions and positions and places so that what? What comes out of design and order? Yeah, it's the opposite of chaos, right? And when, and when you go back to Genesis 1 and to study Genesis, the creation, out of chaos, God brought order, right? He took nothing and made it something. And when he put it in, he put it in a, in a way that there was a design to it and an order to it that was systematic, that was, that was distinct and clear, that made perfect sense. I, it is just one of those qualities that we have to grab hold of. And I think here's just a teeny little glimpse of that. It's not our subject matter per se, but what we see is design and order here. And in this case, we have God giving it to Jesus, who gave it to his angel, who gave it to John, who gave it to bond service. Now, one of the other things this, this helps us is when you were doing chapter one, who did you see communicating to whom? Who were the community? We know John was the recipient. The angel sometimes was communicating and sometimes Jesus was communicating. So by giving us this list right up front in, in verse one, he's letting us know there is a communication that's taking place and it's given in this order. Ultimately, everything that we know out of this book is from God. God is the one that opened the book and revealed it to us, right? But we also know that Sometimes we literally understand it is Jesus, right? Where do you see that most clearly in chapter one, that it's Jesus speaking? Yes, and which verse are you in? Yes. And he sees Jesus and, he's, and then it describes Jesus all the way through 16. And he said, and when I saw him in 17, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me saying, so there you see who is speaking, an angel or Jesus? Jesus. So just don't lose track of that. Now it's, it's tough sometimes to discern for sure who is speaking. And I don't always think it's super necessary to always know that, but I do think it's, it's as an inductive student, it is one of the things we like to try to keep track of, okay? So that you can mark your key words, right? Um, so when you see that, that there's a direct conversation going on between John and Jesus sometimes, and other times it's the angel telling John, just so you know that that is the way this book is going. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. And I tell you, when people, and yet it's interesting in Daniel, one of the controversies is that it's an angel, that it's Gabriel in, back in Daniel. You weren't here for Daniel, so you missed that one. But back in Daniel, there's an absolute identical kind of a conversation that's going on and the description given of the man in linen is so declarative. And so, and when you line it up with Revelation 1 and the description given to us of Jesus, and it's clearly Jesus, because then he says, and I said, and what you saw in my right hand, and I mean, he, he makes sure you understand it was him, right? Then you know that this description is exactly what you see in the book of Daniel. That's right. That's right. Right. So later we're going to see instances where Daniel falls down to worship the one that's speaking to him. And when the one speaking says, don't worship me, worship God, then you know that was not God. It wasn't Christ and it wasn't God the Father. In this book, we never see God the Father anyway speaking. We just simply see references to him. But when the speaking takes place, it's Jesus or it's the angel. Okay, good. Um, 
The other thing that's kind of just because we're in this area of conversation, let's just stick with it. One of the things that can happen in chapter one, and it happened to me again, even this time, it almost looked to me like this voice with the sound of a trumpet. And he was saying, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. And, and then he says, and I turned to see the voice. So to me, it sounded like he turned to see the voice and he saw the voice and the voice was Jesus. Did some of you get stuck on that? Okay, go to chapter four, verse one, because it wasn't part of our overview. Yes. Yeah. Okay, do you see what it says in verse one? After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which i heard okay and then it goes on uh to speak and come up here and i will show you what must take place after these things so so now the first voice is not identified as jesus but he goes back he goes back to verse 10 of chapter one because this is the first voice right and in this case this voice was a voice and here's this, here's one of our words you're going to be looking at like the sound of a trumpet, correct? Now move over to verse 15. When Jesus is described, what does it say about his voice? 115. His voice is like the sound of many waters. So interesting to me is in the flow of this conversation is the first voice is given and he clarifies it's a voice like the sound of a trumpet. But then the second voice is the voice like the sound of many waters. Oh, wow. Isn't that interesting? And then in 4.1, it says, and the first voice, what well, doesn't say the first and the second voice, it says the first voice you heard in, in 4.1. So now you know from having connected that, that's one of those things about doing it, um, your inductive process is following your, your train of thought. And when you hit a verse like 4.1 that says in the first voice, you go, what first voice? Right? Isn't that what you should do? So then you go back and you say, well, what was the first voice? Oh, it was the voice like the sound of a trumpet. Okay, so that can't be Jesus if in, in chapter four it isn't. And also when the voice is distinguished in the very next time you hear a voice, it's distinguished, it's different. So those are little clues that can help you, I think, identify things. So what we now know is, he was in the spirit and he heard a loud voice and the voice was the angel, which is told to us right here. And now the angel is communicating to John and now Jesus pipes in and now takes up the conversation when he begins to speak. First voice is angel. Right. Right. And so in, in 10, it's the angel. And then when you get to... Um, well, then it, tr it turns to see the voice that was speaking, which was the angel, by the way. So you can mark that voice in verse 12 as being your angel. And having turned, then he sees something else. He sees the lampstand and he sees the one standing in the lampstand. And when the one standing in the lampstand is described, his voice is one that is the voice of many waters. So there's a distinction. And I just think it's interesting that the distinction was made and it was made very clear. This one had this kind of a voice. This one had this kind of a voice. And that helps you to clarify. In Jesus, right. In 15, 12 to 16, you see Jesus being described. Am I correct? Yes. Right. It's a lampstand. There's one standing in the middle of it. Interesting, because he says about that one, um, in his right hand, he held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. That right there should tell you it's who? Jesus. <laughs> yes. And the living one. By the way, I happen to go on a little rabbit trail on that one this week, and you don't have to, but the living one is a title given for God in the Old Testament. He is the living one. And it's over and over and over. So now what have we now done concerning Jesus and God? They're one. 
So Jesus is God, but Jesus is also his, has a distinctive role to play in the equation that we understand. It's going to be a marvelous thing when we actually get to heaven and see these things and it gets better clarified. That Trinity is a tough one. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. He can't be it and showing him. Get... Absolutely, good, good point. I'm glad you brought that out. That's exactly right. If you keep reading, you know that that first that the voice in uh, at the beginning of four is an angel because immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. And then he goes on to describe the one who's sitting on the throne. So obviously that's not Jesus that is showing these things to him. It's the angel showing him these things. Very good. Okay. So Right. That was, that was Remember the transfiguration? Didn't they do that then too? It was really one of those profound moments when they saw him in this transfiguration. Then they wanted to worship. They wanted to build uh, houses or yeah, tents and stay. Yeah, they didn't know what to do with that guy that was now glorified. Exactly. Right. Okay. So now let's look for some historical pinpoints because that's another thing that we want to look when we set context is when is this going on or what or what time factor is being um, talked about in this what kind of time references when you do your homework you are going to go in and put a little clock on top of every time you see a time reference and what you're going to do with that is pay attention to it to see does this show me something that's significant because why do you need to know about time referencing Good, good, because it gives you the order in which things are happening. Either it's now, it was before, or it's after, right? And so it, can, it gives you time reference to things. So what do you see about the time references given to us here? I'm just going to draw a clock. Here's my little clock. That's what I would put on my time references. What time references are given to us? Yeah, that's right. What must soon take place? Okay. And, and it. Yeah, okay, so let's do, let's do that. Hold on a second, let me see where do I want to put that. Let's put, uh, I'm going to put this over here under book divisions. Does that give it away too much? <laughs> he tells them to write. <laughs> and what he's to write is the first thing is the things which you have seen, right? The things you have seen. So what does that tell you about time referencing there? That's yeah. something in the past. Uh, the things what? The things which are, and what does that tell you? Present, and the things? Which take place after these things. Um, we just looked at chapter 4, verse 1. Did you notice that statement there, by the way? After these things, I looked. After what things? And what comes before it? The messages to the churches. So where do you think then, and what were the things that he has seen at the time when he wrote this? What had he seen? The vision on the whole and the particularly the vision of Jesus in chapter one, right? So the things that you have seen are told to us in chapter one, right? 
And the things which are then are the churches. So that's going to be what? Chapter 2 and 3. And the things which shall take place after these things is chapter 4 through 4 through. Well, in our case for today, it's 5. But actually, let's go all the way to the end, to 22. Right? Because now we know our segment divisions for this book. And this is why precept has broke, broke our study down the way they did. They gave us chapters one through, basically one through three is what we're going to be studying. And the, those cover those first two segment divisions. And they're short. They're easy to put together. It's not too much material for us to handle, right? The, the biggie comes when we hit chapter four to 22. Now you've got a, a chunk that you've got to deal through. But it can't be separated because why? It's all the things that will take place after these things, after these things being the church age, right? When, the, when we're done with the church, we move on to the things which shall take place after these things, okay? Pretty cool. Good, good. We got that handle. The book division, that's the big one. Why did Jesus instruct John to write what he saw before he addresses the churches? Why do you think he does that? Why write chapter why write chapter one before he writes chapter two and three and four and five? Say it again. There you go. Again, we're back to we're back to credentialing. This is John. Who is John? He is a bond servant. He is bore witness. Not only that, but he is told to write. Who told him to write? Jesus and God the Father, what did he do? He gave it to Jesus to give to these to the bond servants. So what was the ultimate goal of God in giving it to Jesus? That we, the bond servants, would have this information. So what does that tell you about this information? It's important for us, the church, to know about it. Even though it's stuff that's going to happen in the future and it's going to happen after the age of the church, right? It's, it's apparently stuff that he says, your bond servants need to know these things that are going to happen. Um, I don't know about you, but I also think about this from a, a, a witnessing perspective. Why would it be important for you and I to know about this? Besides just that we would know about it as bond servants. It is our hope of future, yes. And we can warn those who are not yet in faith. We can say, listen, if you're not in faith and you're not a part of the church and you don't get to go to be with the Lord and get rescued out of this time, this is what you're going to have to live in. This is what you're going to have to endure in. And once the church is taken out and that that dispensation, my big new word, <laughs> It, once that dispensation of time is finished called the church and he's now into his new dispensation which is going to be the 70th week of Daniel that last one week and when he's working in that one week you if you're not had not been a Christian so that you were removed you are going to have to endure in this and these are the things that you need to understand are happening but what is the hope in it what did we learn in Daniel about those who who go through that time frame they will be saved it says and in that time frame there are going to be those who are going to be uh purged purified and refined now i don't like the purge part so much right because purging is not probably a good thing but the purifying and the refining and let's just talk about purging out of sin but the purifying and the refining to me are the part that he's speaking about uh, re in reference to people who will endure those who are purified and refined they do what they will go into that eternal kingdom so there's hope for those who have to endure in these things which are yet to come these things which are yet future these things which must soon take place all right, now tell me what we know about time referencing again. Go back to time referencing. When is all this going to happen, according to what you see in chapter 1? Soon. Well, okay, it must soon take place. How, 
How about in verse three? Okay, I'm going to help you out. <laughs> the time is near. Now this is funny. The time is near, and that was given. That's in verse uh, three. The time reference in which this was given was to John. And where were we in the church age? Right at the beginning of the church age. Right, we were at the beginning of John was a, 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 one of the disciples of Jesus. So he was a, and how many years ago was that for us now? Over 2,000 years. The time is near. <laughs> that, it's all relative, right? There you go. I was going to, I was going to, I was going to do this. This is, if we do our timeline that we have done already so far, we started all the way back here in 605 BC, right? With Babylon. followed by Medo-Persia, followed by Greece, followed by Rome. It's, yeah. And that's when the cross occurred, right? We learned in Daniel that in 70 AD, the, the Jewish temple was destroyed but we also had the birthing of the church in that era also, right? Church age. And we know, we don't know when, but there's a time when he says uh, his kingdom is going to be set up, right? The kingdom of God. And Jesus is coming, right? Jesus is coming soon. So he was all the way back here, John, when this was written, right? Uh, I, we don't have a date on any of that yet, but we know it was in, was in the first uh, time frame there, that first generation, because John was an apostle. And he says, uh, soon. <laughs> right? Um, no, I don't think Daniel ever used the word soon. I don't recall that. I should, I think I would have remembered it. Because, because of Daniel's not understanding. But see, Daniel, at the time that he wrote that particular reference, he was at the beginning of the Medo-Persian. He was, he was saying, I don't understand, right? And then G Jesus said to him, go on your way, or the angel, go on your way. He said, it's, you, you know, those who have insight will understand. So he was just saying they will. But that's, it's no wonder he didn't understand because he had all this history and time. He had to wait. You and I are all the way up here, and we're still kind of scratching our heads. But we're not even where John was. We're, we're maybe somewhere down in here. I don't know. I think we might be right here. But... <laughs> Anywhere in there, wherever we are, we're, we're, we're getting close in here somewhere, right? Because we're, we're at the very end of the church age. We're just waiting for this time frame called Daniel's one week that's going to occur. We discussed this when we did our Daniel study. For those of you who weren't there, you won't fully understand. But there's a one week period that God is going work, to work with. Uh, Israel to bring them to salvation and then he's going to establish his kingdom and Jesus is going to come and we are going to rule and reign with him and so when when John says soon I am uh, the time is near time is near and he says I'm coming so soon but then there's another statement and you probably don't fully grasp it but verse 7 do you see the very first word in seven? Behold. behold. What does the word behold say to you? Pay attention. Yes, pay attention. That's exactly correct. Now, if you don't, if you don't know this, you could do a word study on that word behold, because behold literally means to draw, it's it's used as a as an emphasis to draw your attention. And what is it he's drawing their attention to? What's the next part of that verse? He is coming with the cloud. And by the way, what? Every eye. Every eye will see. Now, I think that's interesting. What might be the contrast in the, in the context of this book? Who is seeing what in this book? 
John is seeing. That's right. John is getting to see this and he's conveying it to them by word and he's going to write these things in a book and send it out for them to read. But he's saying, look, not only have I seen, every eye will see. And behold, pay attention, he is coming. And it just says, the time is near. I love this. So you might want to mark, I only have 10 minutes. No, we have to have longer than that. 10 minutes. Are we doing the video today? Do we know how to do that? Okay. All right. Okay. So for those of you who are interested, we will do the video if we can get it running. Okay. So we know then that the, that when it speaks about the time is near, it is relative, obviously, to how much time you think you're in. Poor John is still back here and we're here in a way that that's even, it's not as long as Daniel, who was all the way back here, looking at things all the way down here. John is only here looking forward. You and I are all the way here looking forward. We're all still kind of scratching our head a little bit. But just understand it's all, the perspective here is though, if you think about it from what God is saying, why does he say the time is near? And why did he think it was important for you and I, the church, to understand these things and know these things right now? To be prepared. And he says, the time is near. In the relative scheme of history, now you got to remember, before Babylon, there was also several thousand years, right? Because God created in the, God, in the Garden of Eden, there was the days of Noah, there was the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there were the days of the kings and the prophets, all these other things have happened previously. So when God looks at history in its totality, and he's looking all the way down here on the time frame, he's saying, the time is near. Mm -hmm. There you go. Good contrast. Nice. It's for the bond servants. That's right. Of Jesus. That's us, the church. I, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Why do you think it's... Interest. But what did Paul do? What was... Yeah, what did Paul do? Thessalonians. He had to write a letter back to them. And he said, when I was with you, I taught you these things. They had just, he was there for three weeks, guys. He was in Thessalonica for three, or, or uh, yeah, this, for th Philip, one of the churches, for three weeks. And he was only there long enough to basically birth the church. And he moved on, right? Because Paul's journey. If you go into the book of Acts, you see the journeys. Three weeks, he established a church. And the first thing he did was teach them about the coming of Jesus Christ. Why is the church not being taught that from the pulpit today? Now, there are pulpits that are teaching it because I watch them myself online all the time. But why is most of the pastors not doing it? And especially in this day and time when we so desperately are ready for it and need it. Maybe, maybe it doesn't feel good to them. Maybe they don't understand it. Maybe like, like, right. Right. Maybe they've lost focus. Maybe they're. There you go. I kind of like that. That's a good. I'm. I'm. You guys, we're done. God wins the end. I love that. But honestly, is that what God wants? So God went to all that trouble to give this vision to his. The very interesting thing to me is I want you to follow this when you're doing your homework this week. Track the word 
prophet and book. We didn't have time to go over it today. But when you make your list on the prophecy and you make your list on the books that he's supposed to write, what do you think happens in that, those two lists? They merge. They converge. So pretty soon you find out the book is the prophecy. The prophecy that he's writing is the book. And then later when you see God talking about that he gave a book he, to, and he gave the understanding about the book and then lay, watch, oh, we got to do it. We got to do it right now. Let's go to chapter five because we did chapter five, right? Somebody read verse one and two of chapter five for me really loud so that our people here can hear us. Okay, so you keep moving on. And who was it that's worthy to open the book? Jesus, Jesus the lamb. The lamb is. And d how do you see that book unfold then? I mean, those of you who know a little bit about Revelation, what's inside that book? All the visions, all the things that happen, all these, all of the these things which must soon take place. And what had John been given? A vision about the things which must soon take place. And the vision was written in a book. And where was the where did the book come from? God, who gave it to Jesus, who gave it to the angel, who gave it to all of so where, what book is this book that Jesus is worthy to open and it begins to break the seals? This, this prophecy scroll. It's the prophecy that it was given to John. It's the same book. I had never picked up that until this time. But make the list on the book. And, and if you just logically think it through, what is this scroll, which is for them a book? What is this book that they open? It's all these things that are going to happen that are going to take place soon. It's the same thing that John was said, write it. So what's interesting to me is just like always, we have a copy of it because God gave it to us. Where's the original? In the heavens. God has his copy. We have ours. Ours is called the book of Revelation. You hold in your hand God's word. And he says about it in verse, um, oh, where is it? Seven. He says, behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. What? So it is to be a man. <laughs> what does a man mean? You can do a word study on that this week. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so we now know our author is John. Who are our recipients? Bond servants. And seven churches. Now, when you compared chapter uh, 1 to 22, what did you learn about the churches? Is it speaking of only the seven churches or is it speaking of all the churches? all churches so in other words symbolically seven churches are given to us and they're named by name why that's something you need to kind of consider this week when you're studying why those seven churches why were those seven churches picked out out of all the churches that were going on if even in that time in history there were quite a few already birthed why those seven right what was the function that God used in them? And why seven? I did a whole study on numerology in the word. Did anybody else kind of get caught up in that too? I see two people smiling over here. Remember that because of this book is, what kind of literary work? What kind of literary work are we in? Prophecy. But it's also what? The things which are and the things that you have seen, that's what? History. So history and prophecy are given to us in this particular book. But, oh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, but yes. Okay, so although it's history, it's also prophecy, which can use symbols, right? 
and numbers are symbols. So when you see seven something and five something and three something and what, you might stop to say, gee, why that many? Why that many days? Why that many churches? Why that many spirits before the throne? Because we looked at that, right? How many spirits were before the throne? Seven. Now, wait a minute. Let's look at this. In verse four, he says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen, amen. To him who loves us and releases us from our sins by his blood. Now, what did you see in those two verses? The Trinity. I don't know about you guys, but I marked it. Let me show you what I did. I put a little triangle on my sheet just to remind me or to help me pay attention. The first reference is to him who is, who was, who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne. Anytime you talk about God Almighty, God the Father, he is the one who does what? sits on his throne right right and from the seven spirits now if the first one is definitely god the father and the next one says his name jesus christ who would those seven spirits be the holy spirit why seven seven is a symbolic number it means something symbolically right but if you don't think that those seven spirits means the holy spirit then what does that triune picture what is it even of it doesn't make sense right but if you look at it and you say oh this is god the father god the spirit and, and christ jesus now a lot of time is elaborated on jesus so he's listed last and it goes on and gives you a lot more information when you get into the last part of this chapter there's a whole section that identifies him and, and gives him qualities and characteristics why think about that why why would all those characteristics of Jesus be given? You need to think on that, ponder on that, meditate on it, make a list, do some word studies, even though she's not going to tell you to, do some word studies on those names because they expound your concept of understanding what is being established in chapter one that is going to be essential for me understanding the book in its totality. There's, God doesn't do anything arbitrarily it's always laid out for a reason and as you and i have talked in the past anytime god gives you a title for himself it gives him a name he is god most high or he is god almighty or he is the living one there's a reason he's giving you those qualifiers and he wants you to understand those in perspective to everything that's going to be written after Okay, so if he gives you a title or a name for himself, you need to do your word study on those so that you understand what it is he's saying about who he is. When we did uh, Daniel, it was God Most High, which gave him the quality of being sovereign. And it was absolutely the most essential thing to know for the book of Daniel on the whole. Okay, all right, now, okay, we are over time. I think we covered most everything. We know our author, we know our recipients, we know that this is a time factor and it, the most important thing is that Jesus is coming. And you're gonna see that both at the beginning and at the end and in the middle somewhere, we're gonna see Jesus coming. <laughs> um, we, our literary style is prophecy and history. We see that in verse three, and then you go all the way to verse 19 to see the history. So one three shows you prophecy, and one 19 gives you this list, which gives you your book divisions, right? Um, author's purpose for writing. It pretty, there's several things. What do you see, a purpose for writing? Very good. If that's all you got, that's perfect. To show Jesus' bondservants the things which must soon take place. And one seven, he is coming. That's another point that's important. And then he tells him, this is what you're to write. So those are another 
thing that you need to understand about the author's purpose. You want to understand that there are things that he saw, the things that are, and the things which shall take place after these things. I think it's interesting because why do you think he wants you to understand that starting in verse uh, 4 through 22, that those are things that take place after? Just ponder on it. Um, one last question and we will close and Kristen will not be freaking out. <laughs> what was the promise that was given to the church, to the believers, to the bond servants concerning this writing? Yes, verse three. And? Yeah. And what did he say in 22 about the, about this word? Okay, go to chapter 22. Because remember, we were to do bookends on this. Look at verse 16. Uh, no, it's not 16. Hold on. 18 and 19. Yes. 18 and 19. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. What? If anyone adds, yes. What? Wow. Okay. And we don't know what that all means yet, but here's what I can say to you. What is the contrast then going on between chapter one and chapter 22? In chapter one, verse three, blessing. And chapter 22, uh, was it uh, 18 and 19? Yeah, cursing. Ha! Huh. Do you think Israel caught that one? I mean, in that day, you're talking, she's talking still relatively new to the church. It's still Israel, the nation, and they're still thinking in those concepts. What had Israel been based on? What was their, their nation founded on? A law of blessing and cursing. If you obey this, if you disobey, Cursing. So do you think they fully grasped that? This specific message. And what is the blessing for us? If you read it, if you hear it, and if you heed it, you receive the blessing. So just by doing your homework, you are getting a blessing. Isn't that awesome? Good job. We did a good job, I think, on covering everything we had to cover. That was just a touch. I mean, we barely touched what's in chapter one. So there's lots more to do this week in your homework. Do that chapter three, focusing in on the detail. Go to chapter eight to learn about your different kinds of uh, literary forms, and you'll be good to go for next week.